Thank you. It was just about a year ago uh, that I had a kind of dream, and here you all are. Welcome to the 2013. This is not doing well, is it? Okay. Welcome to the 2013 Visionary Awards Dinner, Dining in the Dark. We are here to support the urgent mission, and believe me, it is an urgent mission of the Foundation Fighting Blindness, to fund research that will lead to preventions, treatments, and cures for blinding retinal degenerative diseases. The restoration of sight to the blind, the very definition of a miracle, has already actually been achieved. There are kids in the world today who were congenitally blind, who now go to regular school and play baseball, the result of gene replacement therapy funded and supported by the foundation and carried out by people in this very room. And <laughs> Do you notice that this room really hums with energy. And that is what the foundation is all about. Creativity, generativity, innovation. That's why we are here. Tonight we honor two people who exemplify generativity and innovation. David Geyer, co-founded and served as CEO of iTech Pharmaceuticals, which develops novel therapeutics for diseases of the eye, he led iTech through private financing rounds, an IPO, FDA approval for Macugen, a treatment for macular degeneration, and its acquisition by OSI Pharmaceuticals. David moved on to SV Life Sciences, a venture capital firm that, as the Wall Street Journal wrote, is all eyes. He has gone on to build portfolio companies, including several that are here tonight, and will be here tomorrow, Neurotech, Ophthotech, and Panoptica. They will be presenters at tomorrow's symposium. And I want to thank David personally, and I don't know where he is, but I want to thank him personally. Uh, his energy and commitment are a major part of why these events are the over-the-top phenomenal programs that they are. Wherever you are, David, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are also honoring Bob Langer. The Langer Lab at MIT is the largest and most prolific biomedical engineering lab in the world. Bob, and, and these numbers just staggered me, so I'm just going to give them to you really quickly. Bob has uh, close to 1,200 articles, more than 800 patents uh, uh, pending or allowed and has helped start 25 companies. And who knows, maybe that's already outdated by a week or two. He has won more awards than I knew there were awards. He founded Kayla Pharmaceuticals, which is here tonight. He is on the board of Advanced Cell Technology, which is here and will, both will present tomorrow. He co-founded Polaris Venture Partners, which at last count, and I'm sure I'll be corrected later, had invested $220 million in 18 Langer Lab-inspired companies. In the dictionary next to the word generativity should be a picture of Bob Langer. To me personally, the most important person in this room is Gordon Gund. His He and Luli are here. Thank you. His life says everything about the foundation. Gordon graduated from Harvard in 1961. In 1965, there was good and there was bad. He was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, but he also met Luli. 
1968, his son Grant was born. In 1970, his son Zach was born. Both are here. Thank you. But also in 1970, Gordon's IP, Gordon's, excuse me, IP, Gordon's RP, retinitis pigmentosa, accelerated. He lost all his remaining vision. That is the disease that I have, and that is exactly the stage that I have been in over the last several months, losing what vision I have had left. Not just my peripheral vision, not just my night vision, but my vision, period. But how did Gordon respond? He investigated and learned there was no significant research going on. I think I would have probably curled up in a ball and hid. I know that experience firsthand all too well. Gordon responded not with resignation, not with despair, but with generativity. In 1971, the year after that difficult event, that was difficult eight months, he established the foundation. He has not stopped. He has raised more than half a billion dollars for research fighting blindness. <laughs> Look around this room. If you were looking for the symposium on ex existential despair, you are in the wrong room. This room, all of you, are all about generativity and innovation. Let me quickly introduce the people who put tonight together, in addition uh, to David Geyer, who I've already mentioned. Um, and please stand when I read your names. Brian Mansfield of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Yeoman's work, I think his title is assistant to the chief research officer or something like that. He's a fabulous man. Ben Ospitz from Fidelity Bioscience. <laughs> Randy Cohen from the MIT Sloan School of Management. Randy's even... Randy is even more blind than I am. Uh, he teaches investment at the Sloan School. In his spare time, he runs a couple of hedge funds. That is generativity. Mitch Brigell from Novartis. Martha Steele, Vice President of the Boston Chapter of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Warren Thaler, president of Gund Investment Corporation, and <laughs> Warren is also a director of the foundation. Uh, Bill Link of Versant Ventures, all the way here from the West Coast. <laughs> and Brian Pleward, Merrill Lynch Wealth Management. Let me recognize just a few other people who are here tonight, and please don't anyone get, get offended when you've got the founder of Vertex Pharmaceuticals and the founder of Genzyme in a room. If I started listing all the people who should be listed and acknowledged, uh, we would, I would be up here all night, and I'm tired. Uh, let me introduce uh, Ed Golub, uh, board president of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Elliot Burson. As many of you know, Elliot is the director of the Berman Gun Laboratory for Retinal Degenerations. He is on the Scientific Advisory Board of the Foundation, and he himself was a, a, a Visionary Award honoree last year, as was Josh Boger. Uh, John Dowling. Uh, he, who is on the Scientific Advisory Board uh, of the Foundation. Uh, I forget. 
John is a seminal figure in neuroscience and will be presenting tomorrow. Thank you all. Now we're going to see a video that tells the stories of two families affected by retinal disease, each determined with the help of the foundation to fight back. Would you please roll the video? Facing a difficult diagnosis. Every father wants the best for their children. They want them to be the best. They want the best for them. They want them to have a better life than, than what we have. I got it when I was like five. Um, that wasn't a very good year for me, actually. We figured out that I had Stargard and I got bit by a dog. There was a time between when he was first diagnosed second opinion in Iowa, where we were told there is no hope, and there is nothing, and that was, uh, those were probably the worst months of my life. Initially, immediately, I cried, was, you know, how, you know, how, why, but I truly didn't labor on that, because the how and the why doesn't matter, it's just where do we go from here. I think, for me, as a parent and mother, it's the loss of control, not knowing, being able to see what he sees. Or, or not see what he sees, I think it's frightening. Um, as it, when I was a child, I was afraid of the dark. Um, and I still kind of am, and I think that's more because I have a son that's losing his vision. Living with a level of blindness. I don't really forget it. I mean, I like know it in the back of my mind, but I don't really pay attention to it very much. I don't think about it a lot. Um, I just like to think I'm just me. I want it to be as normal as possible. And I think when you know that, that he's potentially gonna lose even more vision, um, there's this feeling as a parent that you wanna show him everything now. Sometimes I think they think that vision is the abnormal and the lack of vision is normal. So I think that he thinks that he is the normal and when people can do extra things, it's amazing to him. Well, one of my dreams is you know, for my son to actually be able to drive a car. I never thought about Derek's not gonna be able to drive. When we got to the stop sign, he presented the question to me, Mom, how are we gonna make that sign braille so that I can drive? <laughs> I have a lot of anxiety about safety and social acceptance as he gets older, um, and his coping, how will he cope? A young dad who just has a, a child with a sight issue, I guess my advice to them is, is don't be afraid. Respect what's been given to them, because they're going to learn a lot. Focusing on a cure. We found ourselves searching for a way to, since there isn't a treatment or a cure, what can we do to make that happen? And that's how we found the Foundation of Fighting Blindness. All of the money for the Foundation of Fighting Blindness goes to fighting blindness. It's a unique nonprofit. It is truly a research-based, cure-based uh, uh, organization that's focused on um, curing blindness. And I believe that within Louis's lifetime, there will be some kind of cure, um, whether it restores his vision or stops its progression. Either one, I'd be happy with, and I feel pretty strongly 
and we get a good straight talk from his uh, doctor and uh, his goal in life is really to identify a gene in, uh, in everybody who has uh, star heart and a few other specific retinal diseases. Then they're going to try to grow the new, like, better retina cells. And then they're going to figure out how to, like, implant them in the back of my eye. So they're going to take up the old ones that are bad, put in the new good ones. I do like the logical um, idea of we've identified the gene the gene with a repair gene and uh, make it all go away. This is a disease that seems eminently curable and reversible, which is unique, I think, in the, in the world of disease today. There's a lot of different trials for it, and I think they all look pretty helpful. How do you let a child see on the horizon? You can't. They have to see it. How do you let a child experience a rainbow? They can't, they have to see it. And the only way for the children to be able to do these somewhat unsurmountable tasks is to be able to see. And the only way that we can have them see is with research. And the only way that we can have the research is we can pay the scientists to find a cure. How often do you get a chance to cure blindness for crying out loud? Uh, that's stuff we read about in the Bible and, and it doesn't ever really happen and here right on the edge of making that happen and all it takes is open up your wallet and give a little money. For those individuals who don't have someone with visual issues, what I'd say to them is, you're about to meet my kid. And you'll understand why it's important to continue. Hmm, I used to have dark adapt problems, now I have light adapt problems. <laughs> <clears throat> Now it's my honor uh, to introduce Dr. Eric Pierce. Eric is uniquely qualified to tell you about the state of the art in retinal research, clinical trials, and the global pipeline. Eric is director of the Ocular Genomics Institute and associate director of the Berman Gunn Laboratory for Retinal Degenerations at Harvard Medical School and Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary. The Berman Gund Laboratory, you may recognize one of those names, was established in 1974 with a gift to Harvard Medical School from the co-founders of the Foundation Fighting Blindness, Bernard Berman and Gordon Gund. Most impressive to me, Eric is the chairman of the Foundation's Scientific Advisory Board, a group of world preeminent researchers and business leaders who vet all grant applications and determine where the foundation is going to commit its precious resources. Eric is therefore as in the know about what is going on in research and clinical trials as anyone in the world. I want to thank you all for being here tonight. This is a phenomenal uh, group of people. Uh, yes. Excuse me? Oh. I want to thank you all for being here tonight, is really all I wanted to say. And please welcome Dr. Eric Pierce. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Good evening, everyone. That's a pretty hard act to follow, um, but I'll do my best. It's a great honor to be asked to serve as a spokesperson for FFB this evening. I feel like I've actually been promoted since this is something that uh, the president of the foundation, sorry, the CEO of the foundation, Bill Schmidt, or Gordon, often do. 
but like I say, I'll try my best. Um, I was asked to talk about FFB's role in funding research directed towards improving our understanding of the causes of inherited retinal degenerative disorders, and then using that information to develop treatments for these diseases. Part of this is easy, because what FFB has accomplished in the past 40 years is nothing short of remarkable. Much of you've heard about some of this through the video we just saw. Um, I guess I would focus in on one part of this to get started, which is by starting, by helping start the Berman Gun Lab at Harvard and Mass Eye in 1974, which was the first lab dedicated to the study of inherited retinal degenerations. FFB helped create, in a sense, the field of retinal degeneration research. The field has now grown into a worldwide network of investigators studying retinal degenerative, degenerative disorders. And FFB now supports 15 dedicated research centers and funds research studies by 130 different investigators at 70 institutions around the world. And that's just part of it. FFB continues to fund investigators often in the early stage of research trying to identify potential treatments for retinal disease. And often that early research then supports applications for funding from other organizations such as the National Eye Institute. So FFB funding is often, as we have just heard the word generative, um, and dollars FFB provides can be multiplied many times over. As you've heard, based on, in part, the research supported by Foundation Fighting Blindness, we've reached a very exciting time in the retinal degeneration research field. Work initiated in the lab is now leading to clinical translation of the science and clinical trials of potential treatments for inherited retinal disorders. And you heard Alan mention briefly a great example of that, which is the trials of gene therapy for the RPE65 form of labor, congenital amaurosis, the early onset severe form of blindness that some of the children in the video have. It's very exciting that multiple centers are doing these trials, and the results from those studies continue to be positive. And that particular therapy is now in phase three trials, which is very exciting. Phase one trials for four other genetic forms of inherited retinal disease are now in progress as well. And there are multiple other potential gene and genetic therapies in the pipeline, including six that are now in the pre-IND or preclinical phase funded by the Wynn-Gund Translational Research Acceleration Program of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. So at this critical phase in our research field, <clears throat> FFB has created the FFB Clinical Research Institute, or CRI, with the goal of helping bring potential therapies like these into clinical trials. The goal of FFB CRI is to help develop and catalyze partnerships with investigators, biotech and drug companies, and venture capital firms to jointly bring potential therapies that have demonstrated promise in the lab into clinical and human use. The symposium on an innovation in retinal research tomorrow is directed towards that goal, and we're all looking forward to an exciting and productive day. So I think that's a critical phase we're in, trying to move even more therapies from the lab into the clinic, and obviously that's what drives us all. But I can't help but take a moment, since I've got the podium, to also say that while the clinical translation is important, I also think the, tradi the traditional mission of the Foundation Fighting Blindness remains critically important. That is, to continue funding research, laboratory-based work, to identify new potential therapies that can ultimately address all the different kinds of inherited retinal disease. And I think you know that's where many of you come in. Um, thank you for your continued support of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. The funding you provide helps us all work together to develop treatments and cures for inherited retinal degenerative disorders. So, all right, that was the easy part. Um, now comes the harder part of my job this evening, which is to introduce Gordon Gund. So what can I say about Gordon? Um, it's hard because Gordon's one of my heroes. It's an honor to work with him. It's an honor to help serve the Foundation Fighting Blindness and help advise the board of directors about scientific issues. It's inspiring to do this work, and inspiring to think about what Gordon and the Foundation have achieved. As you just heard, Gordon and his wife, Luli, were part of the small group of affected individuals and their family members who founded FFB in 1971. 
Gordon was motivated by, as you heard, by being affected with retinitis pigmentosa and having that affect his vision. But over the past 40 years, Gordon has helped make FFB about helping everybody with inherited retinal diseases. And that's pretty inspiring. So I feel like I've actually stepped up in the world here. When I get to introduce Gordon, I feel like I'm actually playing, you know, kind of warm-up group to a real star. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me, join me in welcoming the Foundation's Chair of the Board, Gordon Gunt. Well, uh, thank you, Eric, very much for that thoughtful introduction. Uh, I knew when we gave you the podium, we'd hear both sides of that issue, and thank you for bringing it up, because you're absolutely right. It's all about balance. But also, most of all, I want to thank Eric as the, as the chairman of our scientific advisory board for the terrific job he's doing, and similarly for the very important, uh, very exciting and promising research he is doing and directing. So thank you, Eric. And uh, let's... <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and uh, I'd like to say welcome to everybody and thank you all for being here and for supporting uh, the foundation and its research efforts, a very highly promising and increasingly successful research efforts to find treatments and cures for blinding diseases. Um, I, I, uh, I must say it's very exciting for me and that was my wife, Luli, who I I guess I really should also introduce to start with. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, uh, Luli is also a co-founder and has done a fabulous job over the last 42 years in not only running the Princeton, New Jersey chapter of the foundation, but providing a lot of wisdom to the organization nationally and beyond. Um, when, uh, when Alan Spiro was talking, I couldn't help thinking, if he's tired, he has every reason to be. He has done a phenomenal job. Alan, you really have done a great job in not only putting this dinner together and driving it through the way you have, but also in working on tomorrow's symposium, which is terrific. Here's a round of applause for Alan. <laughs> I, I hope you all enjoy the dining in the dark tonight. Those of you who haven't had the experience, will understand this even better, maybe because they already do, those that have, uh, that, that when my wife sometimes threatens me with a surprise party for one birthday or another, I say, don't worry about that. Every party I go to is a surprise. <laughs> and and uh, she still threatens me. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, uh, this, this being here is a, is a major uh, re uh, homecoming for the foundation every year, because this is really the site where the research really got started. When, uh, when we started in 1971, uh, as you heard, uh, there were just a handful of families that all shared the same common goal of trying to find ways to treat or cure retinal degenerative diseases. And, and, uh, and at that time, I had just lost my sight, as Ellen mentioned, a year before from RP. All I had left, and I still have a little, is light sensitivity right way out on the periphery of my retina. But I don't see anything else, and, and I couldn't then. And I tried a few treatments as my uh, eyesight was going, relentlessly deteriorating as the way these diseases work. I tried some treatments that were non-scientific, and needless to say, they didn't work. But that was what really convinced us uh, at the outset, and from uh, then on, we've been dedicated uh, to, to uh, only funding, strictly funding, scientifically-based research. And when we started, there was almost no, no knowledge about these diseases or about the retina, and there was very little research going on. So it was very clear that we had to start from the beginning and take our first step. And the first step was to start the first of its kind multidiscipline laboratory to study these diseases. You see, there, there wasn't any then. There were no laboratories. There were one or two people doing research, and valiantly so, but by themselves, no multidisciplined effort. And we decided we wanted to do it through Harvard University, and we wanted to do it under the direction of Dr. Elliot Burson at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary. And uh, 
that was really the rallying cry around which we built the foundation to begin with. And thankfully today, and, and during that time, I should say between now, then and now, uh, Elliot and his um, colleagues have developed several uh, therapies that help, have helped uh, certain patients with certain of these diseases uh, uh, from losing their sight and really slowed the degeneration in some cases, giving people as much as 20 more years of useful vision than they might have had without these uh, vitamin supplement therapies that, uh, that Elliot has done trials on. But today, that same laboratory under Elliot's continuing direction and that of Eric Pierce is doing some of the best research on, on the retina in the world. So it's a very exciting thing, and that's, that's where we started. But when we started, we also knew that as lay people, uh, we, weren't gonna, we weren't gonna be able to decide what the best science was or take full advantage of new technologies without a, a world-class scientific advisory board. And one of the people you heard him introduced earlier uh, that was most instrumental in our getting that advisory board started back in 1972 was John Dowling. John, thank you. So another, another uh, guy from Cambridge and <laughs> was the head of the Department of Biology in those days at Harvard when, when he helped us get this done. And what it also entailed was attracting young people, newly minted uh, uh, MDs, clinicians, and, and PhDs, basic scientists, into the field because there were really very few. Uh, and he was extremely helpful, and the Scientific Advisory Board has been really one of the most remarkable assets of the foundation over the years. So, so we also have a lot of other ties to the Boston area. Uh, of course, there are wonderful academic institutions here, and so a lot of great research, very talented people being attracted here, and a lot of innovative commercial interest in in those things, so it's just a fertile ground for us for retinal research and for clinical trials. We also have uh, a major chapter here that has been with us for more than 30 years. A lot of people involved with it, some of them for almost that long, are here in the room, and they've raised millions of dollars over the years for this research. And tonight I'd like to honor one family that's part of that chapter. I'd like to pay tribute to them. They lost uh, their patriarch um, last December. Uh, Tufik Hajar. Tufik uh, was, uh, it was a remarkable man, a wonderful family man, uh, a tremendous businessman, and a remarkable philanthropist to a lot of causes, not just to ours. Um, and, just, uh, and, and we will always remember him with great admiration, great respect, and great fondness. He, uh, Tufik was... In, in his memory, his, uh, uh, as the, their uncle, Ann and Chuck Hajar, uh, made a significant donation recently uh, uh, directed towards Usher's research. You see, three of Tufix and Linda's five children have Usher syndrome, which means they are not only subject to vision loss, but also hearing loss. Uh, and and uh, a remarkable group. Uh, uh, one more round of applause. There are a lot of the Hajars here. You see, it, it all begins with family, trying to do their utmost uh, for their own. And part of that is to invest in the Foundation Fighting Blindness, which I'm proud to say has returned, given a great return on that investment over the years, over the last 42 years, and is at the threshold of providing much more of a, of a return to that. Uh, with a lot of breakthroughs, you heard about many of them. I mean, just imagine, we can slow the progress of some of these diseases, uh, by surgically implanting a tiny protein dispensing capsule in the back of the eye, and that can slow down or halt the progress of some of these diseases. Uh, you, you also know, probably have heard about uh, this um, bionic eye that just got FDA approval. It's called Argus II, and it's very helpful now in the current generation to people with very limited or no vision. Someday they'll increase the size, the amount of pixels, and it'll give more and more information. Uh, I'm proud to say we had a lot to do with uh, making that possible, that new technology possible in the first place with early stage financing. A great example of venture philanthropy. Um, and also, you heard about the, the gene therapy for 
young children that has restored their vision and is a platform for a lot more therapies to come. These, these breakthroughs and many others are leading to a lot of clinical trials. And of course, that's where you have to go in order to get FDA approval and in order to get these things out to the marketplace. But those cost significant amounts of money, tens of millions of dollars in many cases. And, and so as we, as we look forward in order, order to keep the momentum going, which we all desperately want to do, we need to increase the amount of money we raise. We need over the next 10 years to raise as much as we've raised over the last 40 plus years. That's more than a half a billion dollars. That's our goal. We need to do it because we need to do it for the Day family. You saw Derek and Meredith and, and Louis McGee in the, in the video and for the Hajar family and for 10 millions, millions more families around the world. We want to get this job done. We need to do it so they have a brighter future. So my wife, Luli, and I thank you all for being here. We hope uh, when you, after you've been through this Dining in the Dark experience, you'll understand even better why your support means so much. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Gordon, for those uh, most inspiring words and for uh, leading this tremendous foundation uh, over the past 42 years since its founding. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Minow. I'm the Chief Development Officer for the Foundation Fighting Blindness, and I'll be serving as, uh, uh, as your MC for the rest of the evening. Uh, as, we, as, as we talk about families, um, I do want to recognize one other family real quickly because Gordon kind of skipped over them, but many members of Borden, Gordon's family his sons, his daughters-in-laws, brothers, sisters, have long been involved with the Foundation Fighting Blindness, and I want to recognize them for their generosity and their leadership, particularly here in Boston. Thank you. Before we do anything else, it's time to eat. So please allow me to give you a few brief instructions on how we are going to dine in the dark tonight. On your tables, you will find these light blocking masks uh, that they will be used during the dinner. They will block out all light, and at the same time, we will dim the lights in the room to a very, very low level. These are great masks because when you put them on, you can keep your eyes open, and after a short period of time, you really don't feel the mask at all. Uh, at the end of the evening, if you like the mask, if you think you can use it, by the way, you can, uh, you can keep it for a $20 donation, and there's, uh, there are envelopes uh, on the table, and folks will uh, collect that when they come around to collect the mask. To give you a sense of what this evening will be like, we will conduct a 30-second test to try the masks. If after the test you decide not to dine in the dark, you can simply stay in your seat and not use your mask. Not participating is no problem, but please, cell phones off, keep the rooms dark so we can make sure that those who do want to enjoy the evening in the dark can do so. So let's take a quick test. We're gonna do a 30 second test. When I count down, would everybody please put their mask on? One, two, three, let's put on our mask. Yes, and you can, I don't know about those ears. Are we going to do something? All right, is everybody ready? We're going to take a break for 10 minutes, and that will give you plenty of time to orient yourself, take one last look at the silent auction items out in the lobby. Um, the silent auction will end in approximately 10 minutes, and if you haven't already put in a bid, please, this is your last chance to do it. 
Uh, make sure you orient yourself, that you find your wine glass, and I'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. Welcome back. OK, sorry to interrupt your conversations. Time to eat. Are we ready? Three, two, one. That always works. Welcome back. We're about to officially begin. And we do have volunteers available for any assistance that might be needed. Please turn off your cell phones. Uh, and do not use them at any time during the dinner. And I also want to announce that the auction is now closed. And there will be a list of uh, auction winners um, out front after the dinner. Uh, the dinner tonight will last for 25 minutes. And for the full effect, please, no peeking. And I have attended a great many of these dinners over the years. And I'd like to share with you some advice that you might find important for your personal safety. I learned the hard way not to break these five simple rules, so it's important that you listen up. First, when the lights go out, resist the temptation to unleash your inner child. <laughs> Rule number two, no kissing your neighbors. <laughs> rule, rule, rule number three, rule number three, do not pretend to be the husband of any woman at your table who is not your wife. <laughs> Rule number four, keep your hands on your own utensils. <laughs> and rule number five, the wine is great, but do not attempt to drive home with your mask on. <laughs> that said, if you need to remove your mask during the meal, please do so if you become uncomfortable or have an emergency. So is everyone ready to dine in the dark? Yeah. All right, prepare to put on your masks when I count to three. This is the real thing and it will last for 25 minutes. We'll let you know how you did when you take your masks off. Ready, are we go. One, two, three, please put on your masks and welcome to dining in the dark. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. You have lived through dining in the dark, and we will now slowly turn up the lights, and you can remove your masks. I do hope you all had a memorable dining experience, and volunteers will now be going about the room to collect their masks. If, once again, if you'd like to take yours home, they're available for purchase for $20. And you can just give that money to the volunteers collecting the masks. We are going to take 10 minutes while dessert is served, and then we'll be back to start the official awards presentation. Thank you. Good evening once again, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Three, two, one. Shh. Oh, thank you very much. Next up is the presentation of our first Visionary Award. We're doing something a bit different tonight, starting first with a very brief video which was put together in David Geyer's honor by a colleague of his, Anthony Adamus, who was the vice president and global head of ophthalmology at Genentech. And Tony himself is a former recipient of the Visionary Award at our San Francisco dinner. So in honor of our first honoree, David Geyer, please roll the video.
system is a side of things. You can be better in your career. There's been further ophthalmology. And you come up with novel treatments for patients who are losing vision and going blind. And you've been extraordinarily successful with that. I don't think everybody in this room tonight knows that you helped lead the first drug trial in ophthalmology at AMD in the age-related vascular degeneration. You were the uh, co-chair of the interferon trial. And that set the template for all the trials that were to follow. And then I was privileged to work with you as we developed the first anti-VEGF in ophthalmology. Uh, and took nitrogen all the way to FDA approval in 2004. And uh, it's just been a terrific ride. But uh, even after iTech, if Nitrogen can continue that work, creating companies in your role now as a venture capitalist, and again, uh, advancing the science constantly, trying to improve the lot of patients with vision acuity problems and vision diseases. So it's hard to believe that when we first met, it's been 23 years now. We were together with fellows at the Mass Eye and Air Infirmary. I think we were the only unmarried fellows, and neither of us could cook, so that ended up uh, in us having a lot of dinners together. And who would have thought that those dinners and all the scientific conversations and, and other conversations we had, uh, that that would lead to this lifelong partnership. It's been my distinct privilege to work with you, uh, to continue to work with you as we as we survey the landscape of ophthalmology, um, and uh, it's just been an honor to be part of uh, the things that you've created, the things that you've moved forward, and I look forward to continuing to do so in the future. So congratulations and best of luck in this world, well deserved. It is now my honor to introduce Dr. Carmen Pugliafito. As Dean of the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California, Dr. Pugliafito is a visionary and an academic leader. He is also an innovative clinician scientist who co-invented optical coherence tomography, or OCT, and was the first ophthalmologist to use OCT to closely study the macula, or the central part, of the retina. Prior to taking his post at the Keck School, Dr. Pugliafito served as the chair of the Department of Ophthalmology, first at Tufts University here in Boston, and then at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute in Miami. He was also a founding director of the New England Eye Center and began his career at Mass Eye and Ear in Harvard Medical School, where he was the founder of the Laser Research Laboratory and an associate professor of ophthalmology. Ladies and gentlemen, here from Southern California, please welcome Carmen Pugliafito. Dr. Pugliafito. Well, it's great to be here, and it's been 23 years since I met David Geyer on the 12th floor of the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary. He was my fellow. And, and I'd like to start off by saying this. We're a mile from Fenway Park and two miles from Harvard, you're getting a big award, not bad for a guy from Yale who's a big Yankees fan. <laughs> really got, in Boston, we get to the point. But tonight we are honoring someone who is indeed a scholar. He was summa cum laude graduate of Yale, number one in his class at Johns Hopkins. And really, Mort Goldberg told me he was the best resident he ever had at Wilmer. OK, that's true. He's really an innovative scientist. He did pioneering work on digital imaging of indocyanine green. Tonight, we haven't mentioned he's an academic leader. He was chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at the New York University School of Medicine. He is an innovative entrepreneur, founder of iTech. And really, he is a godfather as well, because he is the godfather of retinal pharmacotherapy. And I see here tonight all the individuals to support the development of cures for retinal disorders. But as Tony Adamus referenced, iTech and the 
drive toward developing effective anti-VEGF therapy really has set the stage for a very optimistic viewpoint about the development of new pharmacologic, genomic, and technologic cures for retinal disease. And, and David has been truly a leader in that. But there is more. He is a philanthropist, and we've heard about his tremendous support for the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And I know him as a compassionate physician, because I saw him as a trainee, and I've followed his career the last 23 years. I know him as someone who has been concerned for the visually impaired. He's someone who's run the New York Marathon multiple times with a blind runner. So David, congratulations on this very, very deserved award. Come on up and get it. Thank you uh, for this great award. 25 years ago, uh, I remember being in a medical school uh, class on ophthalmology. John Talmo, a good friend, was in that class. And I remember they were describing treatments, a very new treatment for macular degeneration, laser photocoagulation, where you take a laser and you basically destroy the precious tissue, the retina that you're trying to save, basically cutting off the hand to save the arm. And I remember thinking, this really seems barbaric. There's got to be a better way. And that really, I think, was the beginning of uh, my interest, which became my academic interest, in uh, pharmacotherapy, drug therapy for macular degeneration. And I've been really privileged in being able to see a truly great evolution from destructive laser to drug therapy uh, over the last years. And it's an, it's an evolution uh, where we went from a disease where when you got the diagnosis of macular degeneration, you would be progressively lead to blindness, to one where today a third of patients have significant visual improvement and over 90% have stability or improvement. An amazing jump forward, like a penicillin, a magic bullet to see a treatment go from one extreme to the other in such a relatively short period of time. And I've been um, very fortunate to see this revolution through three different careers. Uh, as an academic, as chair of the department at NYU, as uh, a CEO of iTech, and uh, in the venture world as a partner at SV Life Sciences. And I just wanted to share uh, a few perspectives from each of these uh, vantage points. First, uh, in academics, uh, although I was trained to be a microsurgeon, I really was very frustrated in that there was very little I could do for patients when I practiced. Uh, in fact, I felt more like a psychiatrist, trying to help patients cope with vision loss, because there was very little I could do as a practicing physician uh, in those days. Uh, and also frustration, because just before iTech, we really could not convince uh, pharma that macular degeneration had a large market and was worthy of research. And I remember one story where Tony and I and Samir uh, went to a major company and we, we were very interested in VEGF therapy. We thought we, the target for anti-VEGF was very important and we wanted to do academic trials. And the head of marketing at this company said to us, well, we've done all this extensive market research. We're not interested in sponsoring your trials because uh, if you lose one eye, you still have the other. And I remember being stunned because if you live long enough, it'll always go to the second eye by that response that, you know, farmer just, at least at that point, uh, in the 80s, didn't under, 90s, did not understand uh, the importance of this disease. And really, that's why we started iTech. I thought I was going to be an academic medicine a chairman forever. I loved writing papers, giving talks. And it was more the frustration that I couldn't get trials done in academia that led us to start um, iTech. Now, in my second career in industry as the CEO of iTech, you know, there's several things I'm very proud about. The most important is that we were able to develop uh, and commercialized the first anti-VEGF, which really saved vision for so many patients. And 
that, that led to uh, better anti-VEGF second generation uh, products that improve vision uh, even more. The other thing is that we really built a great team at iTech, and I'm very proud that of my senior management team, six have gone on to become CEOs, several in the audience today, and two partners at venture capital firms. So, uh, you know, it was really just very proud of the great team that we built to do this. And finally, when we started iTech, there really was not a lot of venture money in ophthalmology. It was less than 50 million a year invested, mostly in devices. And today, there's been a six-fold increase to over 300 million a year invested by the venture community uh, in ophthalmology. And obviously, uh, that type of raise is what is going to uh, cure diseases in the future. And then finally, uh, in the venture world, in my third career, being able to build companies like Optotech, Panoptica, Imogen, meet great entrepreneurs uh, and try to find great assets, uh, you know, has just been incredibly exciting uh, to do. In the end, uh, it's all about people. And if I could have the first slide. Uh, first, in accepting this award, I would like to first thank the foundation, um, Gordon and his team. Uh, you heard from Gordon before, truly unbelievable that he and his team have been able to raise half a billion dollars uh, in, in uh, the existence of the foundation. And I, I would also like to thank Alan and Brian and Lisa, who have just been a pleasure to work with in putting the symposium on tomorrow. Just incredibly uh, great hard work and a, and a great team. So uh, thank you to, to you guys for what I think will be a great meeting tomorrow. I, I'd also like to thank uh, Carmen, not only for the uh, great introduction, uh, but for being such a great mentor. And I remember the first day of my fellowship at Mass Ioneer, walking into his office uh, and realizing that not only was I, I was going to work with a great academician, but someone who really understood the business of medicine. And I really think that my entrepreneurial spirit started that first day in fellowship because uh, Carmen just taught me so much about business and medicine and how the two went together. I'd also like to uh, thank my great friend, uh, Samir Patel, who founded two companies with me, iTech uh, and Optotech, uh, and all the adventures we've had there. Other great friends who have been here today, John and Andrea, uh, Rick, Paul, my chief operating officer at iTech, David, Nick, Bill, Tony, and so many others. Thank you all uh, for uh, being here today. And I would especially like to thank my partners, not only for being so great to work with, and Jim, Gene, Mike, Darren, and Tom, thanks for being here in person tonight, but also for having the trust and confidence in me uh, in being the first investor in iTech. Uh, SV was the first investor when I was a first-time CEO with no track record, and really believing in me uh, really is what allowed iTech to happen. And now that I'm at SV, I have you know, access to the old archives, and so I thought it'd be interesting to kind of find out a little bit about what the investment committee said to me after my initial pitch for iTech. And I figured it'd be the typical thing, question the market, is it that large? Question the target, is it validated? But you know, I found out the major risk was first time CEO with an MD degree that wants to do a startup in New York City. So I'm glad that worked out, and thank you for your support there. And most importantly, of course, I want to thank my wonderful wife, Maria, uh, who's been a great partner in life. She, she's been incredibly tolerant with all the work it's really taken to do this. Uh, for example, I remember uh, she was completely fine in putting off the honeymoon because we did our iTech IPO in that time. I realized, though, that I really was pushing the limit uh, just at the birth of our first child because by pure chance, uh, after we went public, our annual general meeting, very important for a public CEO, the first time you talk publicly about your company, happened to be scheduled by chance on the same day that our first child was uh, scheduled to deliver. But I wasn't that worried because I knew from med school that uh, usually you don't deliver on time the first time. So I remember the night before I said to her, whatever you do, don't go into labor between 9 and 11 the next day. And sure enough, at 7 in the morning, she's got cramps. And next thing I know, we're in the hospital, and I'm on a cell phone calling into the annual meeting while she's in labor. And, and then she said to me, after a little while, I think it's time to get off the cell phone. That's when I knew I was pushing the limits. And of course, I'd like to also thank uh, our children, Oliver and Luca. 
I don't want to say that um, iTech was their first word, but it was pretty close. Thank you all very much uh, for the award. Thank you, David, and congratulations on a spectacular career, and thank you for your support of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Our second presenter this evening is Terry McGuire. Terry is the co-founder and general partner of Polaris Venture Partners, focused specifically on life sciences investments. Terry also represents Polaris on the boards of many drug development companies and is chairman emeritus of the National Venture Capital Association and chairman of the Global Venture Capital Congress. Terry sits on the boards of many academic institutions, including the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth College, MIT's David Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research, and the Arthur Rock Center for Entrepreneurship at Harvard Business School. Terry was listed in Forbes' Midas 100 list, Top Tech Investors for 2011, and is a recipient of the Albert Einstein Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Life Sciences. Won't you please join me in welcoming Terry McGuire. So it's a, uh, it's a true pleasure to present this award this evening to, uh, to Bob Langer. As Alan referenced earlier, I've known Bob really for the last 20 years. Uh, and in fact, we started over a dozen companies together. Uh, so to say that I know him well is, is sort of an understatement. And so I was trying to port, find a way to portray Bob to this audience. There's many people in this room that know him well and others that don't. And so I thought I'd look at a couple different dimensions. Uh, and one dimension was to simply start with the numbers. And, and Alan referenced some of this earlier. Consider a researcher who, still in the prime of his career, has already 800 patents in the medical space, probably making him the most prolific medical inventor in history. Um, 100, uh, I'm sorry, 1,200 uh, publications resulting in 80,000 or 84,000 citations, which is enormous. Uh, Bob, as was referenced, has started 25 companies. And if you consider the 250 companies that have taken technology out of Bob's lab, uh, they represent revenues of approximately $1 billion this year. So others will know Bob by the accomplishments. Uh, MIT Institute professor, a member of all three national academies, arts and science, engineering and medicine. Uh, he has over 220 awards, including the Draper Prize, the Millennium Prize, the Priestley Medal, the Wolf Prize in Chemistry, the Albany Medical Prize, the Gardner Prize, and the Lemelson MIT Prize. And on top of that, he has 20 honorary degrees from places like Yale and Harvard. My favorite here is that, uh, and I've had others describe Bob as a national treasure. Uh, and so uh, it's interesting, President Barack Obama and George Bush didn't agree on many things, but one of the things they did agree on was Bob. Uh, so in 2007, uh, George Bush presented Bob with the National Medal of Science, and in February of this year, President Barack Obama presented Bob with the National Medal of Innovation and Technology, making him one of only six people who've ever received both of these awards. Yet still, there's people that know Bob as a mentor, and in fact, it's striking that 600 people have gone through Langer Lab, uh, and approximately 40 have gone on to faculty positions at great universities like Harvard and Stanford and Yale and, and Hopkins and, of course, MIT and Cornell, Bob's alma maters. 10% um, have gone on to clinical medicine uh, and to best teaching hospitals. Uh, approximately 20% have gone in the industry with great companies like Pfizer and Merck and Vertex and Biogen and others. And then about 30% have gone on to start companies, including companies that we've backed like Air and Al Nylum and Alchemies and Momenta. And then a very few people have gone on to become venture capitalists. And in fact, two of our partners, Amir Nishat and Paulina Hill, came out of Bob's lab. So you will know Bob as a pioneer. His intellectual determination has really changed the face of medicine. Uh, I think it's changed the practice of, of engineering and the paradigms of research. Uh, but more than that, for me, as a, as a venture capitalist, he has become the model of the uh, modern academic entrepreneur. Uh, his work has contributed to the full spectrum of human health, including in areas of the cancer, infectious disease, heart disease, diabetes, and, of course, the loss of sight and blindness. 
We, we tried to, at Polaris one time, we tried to calculate the impact that Langer's portfolio would have on the world, the potential portfolio. Not all these products are approved yet, but if you measure the disease states that the Langer portfolio is going after, it, it measures up to 2.5 billion people one day could be touched by a Langer technology, which is just a striking example of, of research. One other thing that's striking about Bob, I think anyone who knows Bob realizes that uh, while he has all these accomplishments, he's probably the nicest and humblest person in the world. Uh, he's famous for responding to emails in five minutes, and I was going to challenge people to see whether he would do that or not, but of course, I think that would be fair right now. But uh, he's just been a remarkable guy. But I think for Bob, there's another set of people uh, that are more, if not more, important than him, and there are people that he'll never meet. These are the patients and families that will live uh, with, with therapies that have been generated by Langer Lab and Langer, technology, or Langer uh, startups. For example, there's millions of uh, patients today who are suffering from macular degeneration that will benefit from inhibitors of angiogenesis, such as Lucentis. And some of that work was done in Judah Folkman's lab, Dr. Folkman's lab, back in the 70s, and Bob was a collaborator then. So Bob's contribution to treating blindness has really been early in his career. And it's continued on. We've started a number of companies, including Kala and Microchips and other companies which are targeting biomaterials and electronics and cellular therapy and other ways to uh, treat blindness. And so uh, I think we can have a real impact, and particularly Bob can have a real impact on the state of, uh, of blindness and the treatments for it. So that's why tonight's recognition of Bob for me is so poignant. Uh, the Foundation Fighting Blindness has committed itself to uh, the high, uh, having a huge impact on improving patients' lives. It currently sponsors six innovative programs in translational research, costing millions of dollars. And like Bob, the research that you do is not limited to one modality or another. It really is gene therapy, drugs, cellular trans uh, transplantation, and are all being explored for cures, and so it's very exciting. So tonight, uh, I am, tonight is a night to recognize visionary research and so I think it is very fitting that the foundation has chosen to recognize the work of Professor Robert Langer. It's my great pleasure to present the Bob the Visionary Award. So please join me in honoring Bob for his significant contribution. Terry, thank you so much, and thank all of you for honoring me with this wonderful award. Um, and I, I feel also very privileged to share this with David, and I think as I go through some of what I was going to go through as I talk about this tonight, I think there's an enormous synergy in what we've both done. I thought what I'd try to do is tell you a little bit about our research and how I got involved in, in, in this area, but it goes many, many years ago. Uh, so I, uh, I got my uh, doctorate degree from MIT in 1974, and I was a chemical engineer. For those of you that were around even in 1974, you might remember, like just like a few years ago, there was this uh, kind of gas shortage, and the uh, prices of gas kept going up. But not only that, if you lived in Boston, what I remember is when you, I took my car to the gas station, I not only had to pay a lot of money, I had to wait in line for two hours to get my tank filled up. But the consequence of that is if you were a young chemical engineer like I was, you got, is you got a lot of job offers. And, I, and pretty much every one of my classmates at MIT in 1974 went into the oil industry. And I thought that's probably what I should do too, so I interviewed in the oil industry. I actually got 20 job offers. Four, actually, from Exxon alone. <laughs> and, and it wasn't like I was that great or anything. But um, one, of, one of them made quite an impression on me. I remember going to Exxon in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and one of the chemical engineers, he went to MIT about eight years before I did, you know, he was trying to sell me on Exxon. He said, you know, if you could just increase the yield of this one petrochemical by 0.1%, he said, that would be fantastic. He said, it's worth billions of dollars. And I remember flying home to Boston that night thinking to myself that I really didn't want to do that. <laughs> so, so 
I started, and it really was very important to me. I started thinking, what did I want to do? You know, so one of the things that I, I did when I was a graduate student, when I was supposed to be doing my thesis, is I spent a lot of time starting the school for poor children in Cambridge. And I spent a lot of time developing new math curriculum and chemistry curriculum. And one of the, well, that's, uh, so one, one, one day I actually saw an ad in a journal uh, advertising at City College of New York to be assistant professor there developing chemistry curriculum. And I thought to myself, that's great, that's what I want to do, and I wrote them a letter. But they uh, didn't write me back. <laughs> but I really liked the idea, so I, I uh, wrote to all the colleges that, uh, probably about 40 in the United States that had openings in this area uh, for, for such a position. And actually, none, none of them wrote me back. <laughs> so, so that wasn't going so well. So I started thinking, what are some other ways I could use my education in chemical engineering to help people? So I thought about medicine. So I wrote to a lot of hospitals and medical schools, and, and, and they didn't write back either. But one day, one of the uh, postdocs in the lab where I was at MIT said to me, he said, Bob, he said, there's a surgeon in Boston named Judah Folkman. And he said, sometimes he hires unusual people. <laughs> he, he thought very highly of Dr. Folkman. I won't say what he thought about me. So, um, so Dr. Folkman was kind enough to offer me a job there. And this was 1974. And so I began working on two projects. I mean, the main project, actually, in 1974, as maybe people remember, Dr. Folkman had this theory that actually was very controversial. People didn't believe it. And his theory was that if you could stop blood vessels, maybe you could stop cancer, maybe you could stop other diseases. And so my project, actually, my postdoctoral project, was to see if I could actually, actually isolate the very first substance that could stop blood vessels from growing in the body. Tied to that, though, is to do that, and this is actually, when you look at the history of medicine, always very key, is you have to have a bioassay to do that, a way of studying it. This has, from penicillin on, been critical to any kind of medical discovery, and there were no assays for studying how blood vessels grew. So what we started doing was looking actually at an assay, developing an assay in the eye of a rabbit, uh, where you could put a tumor in, which would cause over an eight-week period blood vessels to grow. But the challenge was, is all these substances that we were isolating to stop blood vessels from growing were fairly large molecules. And no one had ever developed a, a way to deliver them in the eye that didn't cause inflammation, and that could deliver these large molecules in a bioactive form. And in fact, if you looked at the scientific literature in the 1970s, uh, people actually had written articles on this basically saying it was impossible. Now, the only thing really that I had going for me is, is I hadn't read those articles. <laughs> so I, uh, I spent about two years working on this, and I actually found over 200 different ways to get this to not work. But finally, I made the discovery that I could modify certain types of polymers and use them to release almost any molecule of any size. And that enabled us to create uh, these bioassays. And by using this, actually, we published two papers, one in Nature in 1976, showing for the first time that you could release molecules of any size, and the other in Science, also in 1976, which was the first discovery that actually angiogenesis inhibitors did exist, and showing that you could take uh, to isolate substances that could stop blood vessels from growing. I should point out, although maybe it was clear from David's talk, that it took another 28 years from that discovery that we published in Science till the FDA approved the first inhibitor of blood vessels. And really, that would not have happened without people like David and people like Genentech, Tony Adamus, and many others uh, doing enormously terrific work. Um, uh, in, in terms of that, and, and really many billions of dollars that came from venture capital and corporate partners and things like that. I should point out also, though, just again to go back to the 1970s when I started doing this, uh, how this work was received scientifically. I remember in 1976 giving the first time, I got asked to give a talk at a major scientific meeting um, in Midland, Michigan, and I'd never given a big talk before. Well, actually, though, I did once in eighth grade but that didn't go real well. In eighth grade, I remember getting asked to give this uh, minute and a half talk, and I rehearsed it in front of my parents' mirror the night before for about four hours, over and over again. And then the next day, I uh, got up uh, and I gave the talk to my eighth grade class. And actually, for the first minute and two seconds, I, I did all right. 
But then I stood up in front of the class and I could not remember the next word. And I stood up there for another minute, absolutely frozen, until my eighth grade teacher finally told me to sit down and gave me a not particularly good grade. I, I think it was an F. So at any rate, what happened is that that always got me very scared of public speaking. By the way, I'm gonna to try to not do that tonight. But uh, I, I see I brought this up with me. But um, so at any rate, um, now this talk came in 1976. You know, I was quite a bit older then. I was 26, I think. And I uh, practiced the talk for a couple of weeks uh, in front of a tape recorder. It was before VCRs. So I was giving this talk to a group of very distinguished older chemists and engineers about what we had done on angiogenesis and controlled release. And actually, this time, many years later, uh, in 1976, I, I felt I did all right. It was a 20-minute talk, and I didn't stammer too much. I didn't forget too much what I was going to say. And I thought when I was done that all these older scientists, being nice people, <laughs> would want to encourage me, this young guy. And when I got done, a whole bunch of them came up to me, and they said, we don't believe anything you just said. <laughs> I, I, I should say I've experienced that quite a few times in my life. Uh, but over the years, um, you know, people repeated it and eventually we figured out what was going on and, and today these principles are very widely used. In fact, as we just heard, angiogenesis inhibitors are incredibly widely used in treating macular degeneration and the controlled release systems are used in all forms of medicine, including various eye diseases for delivering drugs for long periods of time. Over the years, I also got other ideas. I remember in 1983, I talked to Jay Vacanti, he's head of uh, pediatric surgery at Mass General, and he and I came up with this idea of using combining polymers and cells to create new tissues and organs, which actually would lead to the field of tissue engineering. That wasn't real, what received real well either. Uh, a lot of scientists were very skeptical, but today through companies like uh, at, at ACT and others, we're seeing treatments like that again being used to, to, to treat blindness. So, the other thing I guess I should say, and Terry kind of mentioned this, and people that know me know this, but I, I did this academic work, and I'm a, still a professor today, and I love it, but I probably spent the first 12 years of my career at Harvard and MIT doing research and publishing papers. But one thing that was really frustrating to me was that as I'd write these papers, I just assumed if I'd write them, people would read them and people would use them, but they didn't. You know, and what I began to learn is if you're not a champion yourself, if you don't try to take these things out of the lab and create products, nobody else is going to, or at least it happens very rarely. So I decided myself that the way to do that would be to write patents and to create companies. And we've done that over and over again, actually with the help of a number of people like Terry and, and Mark Levin and other people who are here tonight. And uh, that they've been, it would not have happened without all of those kinds of investments. But through that, Wonderful companies have started, companies like Kala Pharmaceuticals, who's here tonight, who are coming up with new ways to treat, deliver drugs to treat blindness, um, and, and, and many others. And so I, I feel incredibly grateful that I've had the opportunity to um, have an academic life to try to, try to make some of these findings. Um, I also feel, again as an academic, that what you're doing, that the Society for Blind fighting blindness is incredibly important. Today in academics, and I'm still an academic, trying to get funding is harder than ever. Uh, right now, I think the pay lines from the National Institutes of Health are something like six or seven percent. Very, very hard for young people to get grants. So the fact that this is, you know, the fact that you're going out and giving grants just enables people to do things that they're probably never gonna be able to do otherwise. I hope that that will lead to new treatments, maybe new companies and new products, and we'll certainly make this a better world, one where we can see better and do better things. Again, I'm incredibly privileged to get this award, to have the opportunity to share it with someone like David, who's done so much, and to be with you, all of you tonight. Thank you so much for honoring me. Thank you very much, Robert. It's very clear, to, uh, looking at tonight's program from beginning to end, that, uh, that we have been, ladies and gentlemen, in the presence of some incredibly talented people. 
and uh, it's just really amazing all that you have accomplished and all that you are accomplishing to help the work of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. We have one more speaker, and before I bring him up, I'd like to thank everyone for being with us tonight. As you can tell, this foundation is a very passionate foundation about what we do, um, and that we put science to work to find treatments and cures for retinal diseases and to restore vision. We put science to work each and every day. That is really the watchword of how we operate. We also are honored to work with many investors and small companies, and we hope to be doing that increasingly in the future, as Dr. Langer said, to really bring these academic discoveries to the marketplace. Uh, that is really the future role of the Foundation Fighting Blindness uh, as we look to our future in raising the money that we need to raise um, and finding the treatments and cures that we need to find um, over the next five and ten years and, and beyond. So thank you for your support tonight to help make all of that happen. Tonight's final speaker is someone that you have already met, but I want to emphasize again just how important he has been to the success of tonight's dinner. Um, I started these closing remarks by saying that we have been in the presence of some incredibly impressive individuals, um, and one of the leaders that we have here in Boston meets that definition to a T. So once again, please welcome the dinner chair and our national trustee, Alan Spiro. Alan. dream last year, and here you are. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thanks to all of tonight's presenters. Thank you, honorees, David Geyer and Bob Langer. It's an honor to be in the same room with you. And thanks to all of you. Uh, I sometimes wonder why I was working so hard on this dinner uh, and tomorrow's symposium. I suspect many of my partners were wondering the same thing. <laughs> I don't expect any magic bullets to appear, uh, but just between us, if any of you happen to have one in your pocket, please see me immediately after the program. I am here to take up the fight against blindness alongside Gordon Gund and with all of you. The work that is going on is awe-inspiring. It is thrilling to read it to the extent I can understand it. I want to be a part of it with you. And I'm not a scientist. Perhaps some of you have heard of my book, Everything I Learned About, Everything I Know About, Neuroscience I Learned in Kindergarten. Uh, so all I can do to help the cause is to support you and the foundation and the work that is going on all around us. If what you saw and heard tonight inspired you, please do all you can to support the cause. If you have not yet made a donation to the foundation, and you can, or if you have the means to give, to give more, please do so right now. I'm told there are envelopes on the tables where you can do so. If your firm or company has not yet made a donation and can, or if it has the means to increase that donation, please do so. Please do what you can to make that happen. How urgent is the mission? Well, 18 months ago, I could drive. A year ago, I could not. Six months ago, I could walk in adequate light for example, in this room, without a cane. Today, I cannot. I went out into my yard yesterday afternoon, and walking through my garden was like walking in a Monet painting, uh, except that it was painful and dangerous and 
not nearly as pretty. I can't go into a restaurant unaccompanied. I now use a blind stick in my own law firm office. Just a few months ago, I did not. That's urgency. There are millions like me for whom nothing is more urgent. And you are their hope and the, you are their inspiration. I'm just hitching a ride on your generativity through the foundation. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Let's keep up the momentum. Let's accelerate it. It is accelerating now. Let us not let it slow. Through our work and our resources, Gordon's mission will be achieved. Of that, I am confident. Thank you, and good night.